Welcome to the Investor News. In this video, we're checking out the most discussed topics related to central banks, the current economic situation, and financial market updates. After last Friday's close, when stocks just completed their best month since November 2020 following a torrid week which saw risk assets explode higher after the US entered a technical recession, after the Fed hiked 75 basis points, and even after PCE came in hotter than expected, as traders became convinced that a Fed pivot is coming, we published a must-read note from Bank of America's Michael Hartnett, Wall Street's most accurate and bearish analyst, who warned that while a dovish Fed pivot is certainly on the calendar, it's not coming nearly as fast as the market expects it, and cautioned that there will be at least one more trapdoor in risk assets before Powell is forced to unleash the monetary firehose, most likely sometime in early 2023. Hartnett also detailed the conditions for the real pivot and how to gauge when to sell just ahead of it. Our take on his note is is here while his full must-read analysts is available to pro subscribers at the usual place. And while some disagreed, most notably Morgan Stanley which said that bad is good again. But wait, there's more the groupthink parade, because really this is just a bunch of axed hedge fund managers and career economists failing to grasp what the market clearly has realized, namely that if you hike enough you will get a recession, expanded over the weekend when even the Fed's biggest of, Neil Kashkari, said that the Fed is committed to doing what's necessary to bring down demand in order to reach policymakers' 2% long-term inflation goal, a target that remains far off. We are committed to bringing inflation down and we're going to do what we need to do, he told CBS's Face the Nation in an interview on Sunday. We are a long way away from achieving an economy that is back at 2% inflation, and that's where we need to get to. Inflation that has continued to exceed the Fed's expectations is very concerning, Kashkari said. Faster cost of living increases are becoming more broad-based and aren't limited to just a few categories, and that explains why the Fed is acting with such urgency to get it under control and bring it back down, Kashkari who is a non-voting member this year and thus his opinion is even more irrelevant than usual, said. Faster inflation is being driven by supply chains disrupted by the war in Ukraine and other factors, Kashkari said, adding that while wages are increasing, they're not keeping pace with surging goods prices. So for most Americans, real incomes are going down, and there's no self-fulfilling spiral of wage-driven inflation yet, he said. Families are finding it increasingly hard to make ends meet, said Kashkari, who served in a key financial stability post at the Treasury Department during the 2008-2009 global crisis. When they go to the grocery store, when they buy necessities, they're not able to buy as much because they're getting a real wage cut. Kashkari said that the Fed will do everything it can to avoid a recession, while acknowledging that it doesn't have a great record of being able to do so. Whether we are technically in a recession or not doesn't change my analysis, Kashkari said. I'm focused on the inflation data. I'm focused on wage data. And so far, inflation continues to surprise us to the upside. Wages continue to grow. So far, the labor market is very, very strong. Finally, it was Bill Edible iPads Dudley, who joined the circus bandwagon this morning, and in a Bloomberg oped, that other former Goldman banker, Goldman is best known for populating central banks with its alumni, whether it is Dudley, Kashkari, or countless others, and NY Fed president echoed what he said in an interview last week warning that wishful thinking won't help the Fed beat inflation. Investors have lately become strangely optimistic that the Federal Reserve won't have to tighten monetary policy much further, bidding up stocks and bonds amid hopes that the Federal Reserve will soon get inflation under control. This wishful thinking is both unfounded and counterproductive. The market's exuberance appears to stem in part from Jerome Powell's latest news conference, in which the Fed chair observed that growth had slowed, didn't commit to another 75 basis point rate increase in September and suggested that monetary tightening might curb excess demand for workers without doing too much harm to those currently employed. This has fueled speculation of a pivot to smaller interest rate increases, with some even arguing that the Fed has done enough already. Don't be confident about such an outcome. For one, Powell repeatedly referred to Fed officials' projections from June, which show the federal funds rate reaching 3.8% in 2023 more than 50 basis points higher than what financial markets currently expect, and difficult to reconcile with the pivot hypothesis. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. As regards the labor market, monetary policy tightening is far too blunt a tool to target demand only for workers not yet employed. 
it affects all parts of the economy that are sensitive to interest rates, and hence inevitably reaches workers who have jobs, too. The greater the excess demand for labor, the more tightening the Fed must do and the more people will be put out of work. The latest reading from the Employment Cost Index underscores how tight the labor market is. Wages for private sector workers are up 5.7% from a year earlier. Also, Fed officials believe that the unemployment rate consistent with price stability is significantly higher than it was during the last economic expansion. This means more jobs will need to be sacrificed to get inflation under control. Some argue that the Fed doesn't need to induce such job losses, that inflation will subside on its own along with the supply disruptions created by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. But the central bank must contend with the world as it is, if demand exceeds supply, the Fed must act to reduce the former even if the latter is constrained. Beyond that, supply disruptions are far from the whole story. Inflation pressures have broadened, as evidenced by the 6% year-over-year increase in the Cleveland Fed's median consumer price index, up from 3.8% six months earlier. All told, the outlook hasn't changed. Inflation is too high, the labor market is too tight and the Fed must respond, most likely by pushing the economy into an actual recession, as opposed to the two quarters of minor GDP shrinkage that has occurred so far. Wishful thinking in markets only makes the job harder, by loosening financial conditions and requiring more monetary tightening to compensate. The biggest mistake the Fed can make is to fail to push inflation back down to 2%. Fortunately, Powell recognizes this, even if he understates how difficult the task will be given the economic environment and the Fed's very late start. Remember what Dudley said back in April, investors should pay closer attention to what Powell has said, financial conditions need to tighten. If this doesn't happen on its own, which seems unlikely, the Fed will have to shock markets to achieve the desired response. For now, the Financial Conditions Index has rebounded back to the same levels it was at in April, relatively easy, but as the chart below shows, the Fed has seemingly been willing to only allow a ratcheting down of tightness, presumably because it feels the market and the economy couldn't take any faster hawkishness. As Dudley concluded in April, this would mean hiking the federal funds rate considerably higher than currently anticipated. One way or another, to get inflation under control, the Fed will need to push bond yields higher and stock prices lower. So yes, those short bonds and various secondary, and former, Fed bankers are making the case that the Fed will, or at least should, keep hiking until inflation finally relents. There are two issues with that. First, as today's PMI report confirmed, inflation has already peaked, and any additional aggressive tightening from this point one will do little to reduce inflation which is already on the way down, but will only make the coming recession far more painful. Second, and tied to that, the political outcry against Fed tightening has begun as we noted in the politics of growth are trumping inflation, Senator Elizabeth Warren penned, if Messrs. Powell and Summers have their way, the resulting recession will be brutal. As in past downturns, Republicans in Congress will press for austerity. Combating Summers' argument on the need for higher unemployment to tame inflation, Warren countered this as the comment of someone who has never worried about where his next paycheck will come from. In other words, Democrats have made their political calculus, as a reminder Biden is a superfluous and very old figurehead who doesn't actually matter when it comes to actual decision-making, and have realized that at this point a recession would pull far worse than inflation. Expect Biden to eventually figure this out in the next three to six months, and Powell to get the official memo, at which point the real dovish pivot can begin. Assuming, of course, Nancy Pelosi doesn't start World War III between China and the US in the next 48 hours. I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time, they get your life. You are not even in a rat race, you're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know, but I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have and I multiply it with 1,000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available, 
and multiply this with 1000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? You know, how should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave. You forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. Join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below, enter your email address and I see you on the other side. Your Marco Stan.